Praise God. Amen. Church, you know, last week we started this series on trusting God and in God we trust. And, and there are so many people who have so many testimonies. As a matter of fact, uh, there are people right now actually commenting online all over the world that are worshiping with us. They're not just watching, they're worshiping with us. Uh, people from all over Syracuse, of course, Buffalo, Rochester, Brooklyn, New York, um, from Delta, Pennsylvania, from Windsor, Connecticut, from Gulf Breeze, Florida, from Virginia, we welcome you, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, Powder Springs, Georgia, they're here with us all the time, Dallas, Texas, Kingston, New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire, <laughs> New Hampshire. Uh, Pray for a brother, okay? Pray for a brother. <laughs> Kenya and Jamaica are also worshiping with us today. Last week, we, we talked about entrusting God, and there's so many of you that allowed us to see what you're trusting God for. You went out to that trust wall, and it's still available today, and it was just so many powerful, powerful testimonies of trust that were there. I, uh, there's just a few of them. I, this is one, trusting God to bring my son home. We're trusting God to strengthen our marriage. I trust God with my family, my marriage, my purpose, and my finances. I'm trusting God for complete healing in my ankle and for my finals. Amen. You can trust God with your finals. Amen. Here's one. I'm trusting God for renewal and healing from every medical disorder and for a creative miracle. We're trusting God together. In this series, as we talk about trusting God, we're talking about trusting God in his wisdom, trusting God in every aspect of our lives. And so, Father, today we thank you that as we open up the word of God, once again, you show us, you give us, Lord God, direction on how to trust you, how to trust you, Lord God, not to fall off, not to give up, but to trust you. Trust the truth, Lord God, that your word says. And we're putting out our trust in you, Lord God, not in the world, not in our jobs, not in the government, not in others, not in money, and not even in ourselves, but in you. We trust in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we gave you an equation for what truly trusting God means. We said it like this, that choice plus change plus character equals true trust. It's going to require a choice. And we'll talk a little more about this later on in the series. But choice is an important. In order, in order for you to truly live a, a life of in God we trust, there's going to require a trust. You, a trust of leaning on him alone. Secondly, we said that it requires character. Character in every area of your life. Character is who you are when no one's looking. Character is who you are when you're not at church. It's easy to put on the character of Christ at church. But when we're somewhere else, when we're at home, when we're at work, what is your character like? And then thirdly, we said that trust equals, um, equals change. And change is important because we've got to make the changes so that we can know that, that, that make some changes in our heart. And we can't do it by ourselves. It's going to require God to help us. Here's a scripture that we, we shared in Psalms chapter 33, verse 4. And I love David because David gave us a glimpse of trust. When you read the book of Psalms, you see trust at its highest level. Because David shared something, and, I, and God shared something with me from how David dealt with trust. You see, often as believers, we think that it's going to be always all good all the time. And that I'm not going to have any issues. I'm not going to have any challenges. What well, David would show us and repeat it over and over the book of Psalms. He's crying while he's trusting God. He's in this place of crying. Now, here's the difference. You can cry and be like, there's no hope. You can cry in fear. But you can be crying in faith. I have cried in faith so many times. I have cried and tears coming out of my eyes and believing God to the very end so many times. And so change is needed for us to be able to trust God. And in Psalms 33 verse 4 it says, for the word of the Lord holds true. Because here's how we do all of this. It's by the word. The word of the Lord holds true and we can trust everything. Everybody say everything. everything. See, some people have it in their mind to give God some things. 
They give God a few things, a couple of things. But the Bible says that the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust him with everything. You see, trust in God is the foundation for the believer. It is, as, as we shared with you from Dr. Cruffalo Dollar says, that trust is the currency for the kingdom of God. Meaning that if we're going to get any of the promises of God to manifest in our life, it's going to be trust that brings those things into our life. And so we must trust the Lord. And one of my favorite scriptures is Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. How many have leaned to their own understanding every now and then? Come on, we've all, let's be, let's be honest. We want to take things in our own hands. We want to kind of control the situation. But the reality is the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And here it is again, in all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways, acknowledge him. With all of the things you do, acknowledge him. With your career, acknowledge him. With your money, acknowledge him. With your marriage, acknowledge him. With your children, acknowledge him. On your job, acknowledge him. With that doctor's report, acknowledge him. No matter what the situation is, acknowledge him. Don't acknowledge Facebook, acknowledge the Father. And in the Hebrew, they didn't read like we read. They read, it read backwards. So it has a whole nother meaning when you start to read uh, 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 Proverbs chapter, uh, the, chapter 5, chapter, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. It says this, and I love this. It says, the pleasing way is to acknowledge the Lord. That's the pleasing way. And in everything, learning not, leaning not to your own understanding is to trust the Lord with all your heart. To lean not to your own understanding is to trust the Lord with all your heart. To, to lean not to your own understanding means I got to trust God with everything. What does trust mean? Trust is simply a firm belief, an acceptance in the truth, the ability or the strength of someone or something without evidence. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a firm belief. What do you do? When life hits you unexpectedly, we talked about the turbulence last week, and we talked about being on an airplane. I've been on airplanes. I was on an airplane this week, and the turbulence comes out of nowhere. And when that turbulence hits, and you begin to feel that air pockets that come, and I'm telling you, it's like, what is going on? You're like, what is happening? Anybody ever been on an airplane like this before? And it's like, some people don't want to fly because of this. But here's how life is, it's very similar. It's shaky. It's unexpected. And we can do one or two things when we're in turbulence in life. We can give up. We can be hopeless. We can be in fear. Or we can trust the Lord. Because life will come at you unexpectedly. Life will bring turbulence to you. As a matter of fact, that's what we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is how to trust God when things get messy. How do you trust him? When life gets messy, I don't know about you, but I've had some moments in my life that have been messy. I made some mistakes. And some people think, well, I made a mistake. I can't trust God. That's the best time to trust him. How do you trust him when things get messy? How do you trust him when you have messy things go on in your life? And If you've been alive at any time, you've heard the word messy or you you experienced messiness in your life, messy situations. Some people got messy handwriting. (laughs) That was was me. I'm going to admit it. I'm talking to myself right there. Uh, Some people uh, just uh, live in this mindset of mess, like excuse my mess. You ever see my, why every time I'm around you, you got to excuse your mess? Amen, amen. We've heard terminology used, messy divorces, messy house. If you have teenagers, you've like messy rooms. But what about when mess happens in my life? What about when life becomes what we now hear all the time, a hot mess? Turn to the person next to you and say, you can deal with those hot messes. Go ahead and tell them. You can deal with the hot messes. Life can be 
a hot mess. And here's the deal. Messy is defined as this. It is when something is marked by confusion, disorder, and out of order, it's, un, it's, it's usually very unpleasant. Can the church say amen? It's where problems exist. It's a state of emergency when life becomes messy. It's when things are in the shambles. Things are shaky. It's when mayhem is all over the place. What do I do whenever I see mess or mess happens in my life? And throughout Scripture, matter of fact, any person you read about in the Bible that have done anything significant with God, they've gone through some mess. And if you say, I'm never going through some mess, you ain't there yet. You haven't gotten to the place in your Christianity where really you can truly trust God. Listen, you have not trust God until you have to trust him through some mess. Because sometimes we try to fake this thing out. We got it all together. Like we've arrived. Like you've been speaking King James all your life. Like all of a sudden, you just know everything. I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm not. No, sometimes you got mess going on. And it's, some, it's one thing, you know, mess, it's not always your fault either. There's mess that other people create. There's mess that uh, the world has. There's mess that I do, that I mess up. And I've messed up. I've done some things I'm not proud of. I've done some things that were messy, and I'm, I thank God for his grace. I thank God for praying people in my life. I thank God for churches like Abundant Life that's teaching the Word and teaching us how to do. Because, now, listen, you can look around right now, you see mess everywhere. It didn't just start with us. Don't think that this is the first time the world and believers and Christians have dealt with mess. Matter of fact, throughout Scripture, mess happened in everybody. Noah got drunk. That's just one of his messes. Sarah doubted God. J uh, Jacob was deceitful. Peter cursed all the time and denied Christ multiple times. Moses had an anger problem. Rahab was a prostitute. The disciples fell asleep while Jesus was preaching to them. I mean, what is wrong? I mean, come on. And had so much mess in their life all the time. So what do I do when, when, when I have a mess? What do I do when life gets messy? Do I stress out? When it's not normal. And so, so many people right now are like, oh, this is so messy. I can't wait till things get back to normal. I got news for you. There's a new normal. And the new normal is that we're going to trust the Lord with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding. In all our ways, we're going to acknowledge him no matter the situation. Somebody preach with me this morning. What happens when life takes a turn that you didn't expect? And I'm not talking about a cracked phone screen. Hey, Mark. Hey, Kristen. Good to see you all. I'm not talking about some, you know, some people, this is it. This, oh, my gosh. My phone is cracked. Are you kidding me? Do you know you can live without it? That's not the end of the world. That can be fixed. I'm talking about with people when they got cracks in their life, cracks in their marriages, cracks in their, in their health, cracks in their finances. That's the stuff. What do I do when that happens? When I hear a diagnosis that is not good news, when I hear a report that is not good news, what do I do? Here's what the Bible promises us in Proverbs chapter 18. Verse 10, it says, the name of the Lord. Not the name of some politician. The name, come on, let's read, read this out. To, let's read it in faith. Watch what happens. Listen, I'm going to show you something with you right now. When you read the word, receive the word. 
Don't just read it just to read it, but when you read it, I'm telling you right now, there's some things in your life, some messes in your life. You're going to begin to get revelation. You're going to get delivered. You're going to get some instructions. You're going to get some peace. You're going to get some comfort. Fear is going to leave. You're going to have faith just reading the Word and receiving it. Let's read it in faith together. All, everybody, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are You ever been watching baseball? And baseball is not, all people don't talk about baseball. Have you ever seen an umpire when a, when a player comes in and everybody's waiting on that umpire to say, safe? Yes. God is saying right now that his name is a strong tower. Yes. And no matter what the situation is, when you slide into that base of the word of God, you are, come on everybody, safe. When the devil tells you it's over, you're sliding in the name of the Lord, and the Lord, the Lord says you are. Come on. Strong tower. I did a little research on it, and here's what it means. The tower is something that is high. The name of the Lord is higher than anything. So no matter what the situation is, God says, I'm a strong tower. You're safe with me. Tower represents strength. There are storms. You know that there are towers that have made it through hurricanes. Everything else fell apart. Ships fell apart. All kinds of oil rigs fell apart. But towers held their ground. God says that I am the strength that you need when you are having situations in your life. Trust me, I bring strength to you. Strong tower means that he's higher than any problem. God gives us a safe place. Everybody say safe. 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 How do I trust him? How do I continue to trust him when it's messed up? When the world's messed up? When others have messed up? When I've messed up? Look at Isaiah chapter 43. Are you blessed already? I've already preached myself happy, and I'm, this is just an appetizer. <laughs> Isaiah 43, verse 16 says, I am the Lord who opens a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I call forth the mighty army of Egypt. You see, it's so easy to read the scripture and look at the lives of what God has done in the lives of others. But God wants to remind us of something here. He says, I called forth the mighty armies of Egypt with all his chariots and horses. I drew them beneath the waves, and they drowned. And their, and, and, and their lives, they, they snuffed out like a, a smoldering uh, candlewick. But forget all of that. As, as powerful as that is, as miraculous as that is, forget that. It is nothing. Compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See? See, he tells you to see it first. Come on, close your eyes in faith right now. That sounds crazy, but close your eyes and see right now. Close your eyes and see as you trust God. He's going to get you through that mess. Trust him. He's going to get you through that situation. Trust him all the way to the end. He says, he says oh, this is so powerful. For I'm about to do something new. I have already begun. Do, not, do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. Everybody say, trust God. God. Say, in God we trust. trust. Say, in God I trust. I'm having you say that because it's important. Because it's amazing how we say it in church. But when all hell breaks loose, when messiness happens in our life, and it wasn't even our fault, how we tend to not trust him. Some people are more willing to trust in in man-made things than to trust the one who made all the things that man made. We trust our friends. Some people trust the media. 
literally live by it. They, we trust airline pilots. You've never met that man. You never walked onto an airplane and asked that woman, that pilot, hey, can I see your pilot's license? You just got on the plane. Think about it. When's the last time you said, you know, before I, I you know, listen, just before I take this flight, I need to see some credentials. <laughs> you trust Uber drivers? Oh, my gosh. You get in a car with a total stranger. You would never ride in the car with them, but you get in the car with them, you trust them. Take me here. You trust. Sit back, get on your phone, and just know it's going to happen. We put our trust in so many different things. We, we, we put our trust in the government. We put our trust in the sun and the moon. You put your trust in the sun last night, in the moon last night. You set your alarm clock saying, in the morning, because you know it's going to be morning. You trust that. Why can't we trust God? Everybody say, I trust God. Not Google. It's amazing how we trust Google first. God, I need some, I need, Lord, I just, I need this. What does Google say? And the facts are real. People put more their trust in Google over God. 5.5 billion searches a day on Google. Two trillion a year. Two trillion searches a year. But check this out. 181 million people read the Bible last year, read the Bible last year. Just 181 million. More people search Google than read the Bible. So where's your trust when life gets messy? I believe that the Bible has some things to say to us. Turn to Proverbs with me, chapter 28. Some people say, I, I depend on me. That way I don't get hurt. But you always hurt you. God will never hurt you. Proverbs 28, 26 from the Amplified says, He who trusts confidently in his own heart is a dull, thick-headed fool. I didn't say it. I didn't say it, but I did. I didn't say it. He who leans on, this is the, amp this is the Amplified, and trusts in and is confident of his own mind and heart is a self-confident fool, but he who walks in skillful and godly wisdom shall be delivered. Shall be delivered. Turn to the person next to you and say, don't be thick-headed. Come on, don't be thick-headed. And then turn to someone else and say, don't be a fool. You got to trust God. You say, well, I can't trust somebody I can't see. I can't trust something I can't see. You've never seen your brain. When's the last time you've seen your brain? Like, you've held your brain in your hand. There's a few people may have seen someone else, but you've never seen your brain, but you believe you have one. You trust that it's going to work, and everybody in your life are trusting that it's going to work too. <laughs> Maybe some people say, well, you know what? That may be the problem. <laughs> a relationship without trust, a relationship without trusting God. Will cause you to mistrust. And what we see now is this consistency of mistrust in our culture. And not just with people that are not born again. I'm talking about believers. We live in regret. First Peter chapter 1 verse 8 says, you love him even though you have not seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him. And you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Hallelujah. Thank you. Even though I don't see him working me out, I don't see how I'm going to get out of this mess. Lord, I'm going to trust you. Yes. I don't know how I'm going to get through this situation. But Lord, I'm going to trust you. My bad decision-making, Lord. I'm, Lord, I've made some decisions I'm not proud of, but I'm going to trust you that you're going to get me through this. 
Somebody right now in the name of Jesus, I, it's a very serious situation, and you're, you're in fear right now. You came to here today in fear. You're watching in fear in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that they have the confidence to trust you, that you trust the Lord and not live in regret. Get free from regret right now in the name of Jesus. God is not a God of regret. And regret is a feeling of sadness, it's a feeling of disappointment, it's a self-condemnation that we put on ourselves and and, 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 and over everything that happens in our life, we're just living in this place of regret. And you can't live in this place of trust when you're living in a place of regret. You're free from that right now. Here's the problem, most people... They have mess and they blame themselves for it and God has set you free. The cross represents your freedom. The cross represents that trust that you must have in him. Forgetting those things which are behind. Philippians says this, Philippians 3.13. It says, brethren, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal, the prize. The purpose, the calling of God, the fulfillment of God, the abundant life. I I press towards those things in Christ Jesus. There's no better example of someone trusting God in the mess in their life in the Bible than David. But when you read David's life, you read his resume, you know, David was known as a man after God's own heart. But his life and his track record was messy. David was someone who knew God, to trust God. But it, he started off as a young person, and, and, the, and the Lord sent, him, sent the man of God there to, to anoint him as king. He didn't become king right away. But when he became king, people seemed to, like, forget about the journey that he went on. David's life was a mess, most of it from his own choices, and most of it, some of it from the choices of other people. As a teenager, God anointed him to be king, and David helped to do some powerful things. He killed Goliath. He killed a lion and a bear. Right along, you could stop right there. Be like, okay, lion and a bear, who? Cool. You trust God. <laughs> David went through successful battles. He ended up doing some amazing things, but his life got messy because he took his trust out of God, and he began to put his trust in his own self. You can read the story t- all over the Scripture He spent seven, eight years on the run, running for his life because the king was jealous of him and tried to kill him. And David did some things he shouldn't have done. He slept with Bathsheba, as we all know. She gets pregnant. First of all, David should have saw this was a flag right away. She out there taking a bath. Her name was Bathsheba. (laughs) She's taking a bath on the balcony. He should have been on the battlefield. But he's on the balcony. He's like, who is that? Mm, the king needs to talk to her. He did more than talk. He, he got this woman, had sex with her. She, of course, gets pregnant. And then David wanted to cover up his sins. He's talking about messing it. But here's a man after God's own heart. He tries to cover up his, his sin and have her husband killed. And God still used him. I can go on and on talking about David. But his life is an example of what God will do if we trust him. Everybody say, I trust God. Psalms 51 verse 7. Let me give you some practical things here. And David said this. What David did to help us understand, you look at the messages of his life. David was not afraid to be completely honest and real with God. You've got to be completely honest and real with God, church. If you're going to get free from the things that is messy in your life, you got to be honest with God. You see, you can't hide from him. You think you can hide from him? You cannot hide from him. None of us can hide from him. God always has a way to let us know. He'll send somebody a song, a, a message. He'll send something to remind you, I see you. And David knew this. David was how God ended up using him with all the mess in his life is that David was completely honest with God. Be honest with him. He knew that God can handle his mess. And so David poured out of his heart. And he always ended as he was crying in his mess and all his mistakes. What David did is trust the Lord. 
Psalms 51, 7, verse 10 says, purify me from my sins, David said. I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a loyal spirit in me. Let me give you some things about your mess and with you and God and how you trust him when life is messy. Number one, God loves us in our mess. God loves you right now in your mess. God embraces our messiness. He provides a, 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 an opportunity for us in our sins. I'm so thankful for this because I think about some of the things that I've done, some of the things that I, I, I'm not proud of in my life. I'm so thankful that God didn't turn his back on me. And some people have turned their back on themselves, and God is standing there with his hands wide open saying, I love you in your mess. He has a covenant with us. He remembers every mistake and every mess that we made, but he doesn't hold us accountable to it. He's forgiven us. Here's the second thing you need to know. That your mess you are in is not the end. The mess you're in is not the end. No matter what you're going through today, you can hold to the truth that this is not forever. This is not forever. The mess that you're going through is not the end of your life. There's more. There's a future. See, it's easy to believe the lie that our messes can disqualify us for God. But God is saying, no, the mess that you're in is not the end of your life. As a matter of fact, this can be the beginning of your life. Amen. Say this. Say, Lord, I trust you with my mess. This too will pass. This too will change. Psalms 56 verse 3 says, but when I am afraid, David said, I put my trust in you. I praise God for what he has promised. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? Here's the third thing I want to share with you. You are not your mess. You are not a drug addict. You are not an alcoholic. You are not a whore. You are not what they've called you. You are not your mess. You're not. You are not what you have done. You are not your mistakes. You are not all those labels. You are a daughter of the Lord. You are a son of God. You are the righteousness of God. Don't let your hearts be troubled, the Bible says in John 14. Trust in God. Trust also in me, Jesus is saying. It's in your DNA. That's who you really are. You're not your mistakes. You're not your failures. You're not dumb. You're not stupid. You're not all of these things. You're not those things. Here's the last thing I want to share with you. You're not alone in your mess. God wants us to understand that we're not alone. By the way, you're not the only one either. It's so easy to believe that everybody got it together. But I got news for you. Everybody, and I mean everybody, the person you sit next to, the person that knows more scriptures than you, the person that's been saved since the beginning of time, every single person, grandma, grandpa, pastor this, bishop that, apostle this, sister so-and-so, brother, brother, brother get up and pray all the time. Every single one of them has mess in their life. The world is messy. People are messy. Life is messy. So don't be surprised when you run into mess. Because mess happens. But here's the deal. You're not alone. There are no perfect lives. And we see these people with these perfect lives. And they seem like they have it together. And they got this, oh, she has a perfect smile and the perfect car and the perfect house and the perfect family and the perfect marriage. All the married people know me, know exactly what I'm saying right now. There is no such thing as a perfect marriage. And if you start believing that, you've made the first mistake. There's no perfection. You're not alone. You're not the only one going through things. You're not the only one having a mess. But here's the deal. You're not alone. 
God is here for you. Let me say this. Your mess is also an opportunity to be blessed. I'm going to say that one again. Your mess is an opportunity to be blessed. Matter of fact, you show me somebody that is blessed, and I will show you somebody that has gone through some mess. All the blessed, messy people say amen right now. Come on. (laughs) There is no way. Listen, you cannot truly be blessed until you've gone through something. We're blessed just because of the grace of God. But I'm talking about that lifestyle blessing. I'm talking about that abundant life blessing. I'm talking about that everyday blessing. That comes through some mess. See, here's the deal. Everybody think the grass is greener on the other side. It's not. Oh, and you know what? It may be. But let me tell you something. That grass became greener because that grass had to go through some mess. You know, fertilizer is mess. And it's green because it went through some mess. It had to grow through some mess. It didn't just show up. Neither did your mistrust. See, if you got to a place where you mistrust God, it's because there was some root that caused you to not produce the fruit that you see in the Word. I want to show you a tree. Here's a tree. God says that we should, fl- we should flourish. And we should be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. And we should produce fruit in our lives. But what happened if I'm not getting the fruit in my life? You see, here's the reality. The mistrust that happens in our life and the mess that we're in didn't just show up. You didn't just become an alcoholic. You didn't just become the things. It didn't just happen. The, you, have to look at, you have to look at the root of something. Yeah. And if we're going to get to a place where we're trusting God with our mess, we got to address the root. Yeah. 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 There's an illustration I want to show you. You see, um, put the first illustration up on, on the screen, guys. Not that one. The actual graphic one that was designed. That one. You see, under our lives, under the ground, we got to understand... Um, uh, Underneath our lives, there are roots in our lives. And those of us that are living for God, those roots are, can be in, a, in, a good, in good ground or they can be in bad ground. And if they are in good ground, they're going to produce good fruit. But here's what happens. A lot of people don't realize, why am I been, I've been saved, I've been living for God, I've been doing all these things. Why am I not seeing anything? I'm trusting God, but I'm not seeing anything. Because if you want to address the fruit, you must address the root. It didn't just start. Go to the next one. That's how God originally designed us, to be fruitful. But go to the next one. See, here's the deal. Some people are experiencing anger in their lives constantly. You're always angry. You have fear, shame, doubt, depression, confusion, insecurity, jealousy, bitterness. Here's what happens. This is the fruit that most people see. And this is what most people blame. Oh, my gosh, I'm so angry. She's so angry. It's so full of shame and confusion. The reality is that's just the fruit. But where did that come from? Where did the anger come from? Where did the jealousy come from? Why are you trusting God? You can't see any fruit, any good fruit. The insecurity, that's the, that's the source of something. And if we're going to live our lives a young the mess of doubt and shame and anger and fear and jealousy and bitterness, we've got to deal with the root of something. Amen. And what we don't do, we got our lives to God, but we don't deal with the root. You will continue to produce anger fruit, shame fruit, doubt fruit, confusion, bitterness, jealousy, and insecurity, and all the other things that go with this. Where did it come from? Go to the next slide. Bad fruit plus equals bad roots. You have to deal with the unforgiveness. We got to deal with with generational curses. There are generational curses that happen in our lives and we've never dealt with them. You gave your life to the Lord, but you have to cancel those things. In my family, we had a, a, a poverty mentality, a debt, poverty, it's just debt and poverty. And I had to break that curse over my family. 
negative information. There are things that you have listened to and continue to listen to that's feeding you. There's negative words and there's bad environments that we've been around. There's unhealthy relationships, emotional abuse, physical abuse. Life experiences is producing these things. And if we're going to get to a place where we're trusting God and getting the fruit that God wants us to have in our life, we have to address the root. And some people are like, I'm ashamed or I'm afraid to talk about it. I don't want everybody in my business. Baby, it's time to get somebody in your business. How long are you going to go dealing with the emotional abuse? Go see a counselor. Go see a therapist. Get in the Word of God and get yourself fruitfully ready to see the promises of the things you're trusting God for. I was told I would not make it to 18. I was told I would be dead. I would not be married. I was told all these things. You're going to live in poverty all your life. You're going to be broke and all these things. I took authority over that in the name of Jesus. I got what the Word of God said about me, and I began to deal with the root of it. And I wouldn't even say certain words. You will not hear me say, I am broke. You will not hear me say, I'm sick and tired. Why? Because I am broken from that generational mindset, that mentality that kept me from trusting God. I can trust God easier because I've dealt with the root of some things. I ain't, listen, I'm not where I want to be, but I'm not where I was. And that's why I can stand here and share this with you. Some of you, you're one decision away from being fruitful in your, prom- in your trust in God. What are the things you need to address? What are the things, the life experiences that have happened to you and you've been holding on to it? The unhealthy relationships that you stay in. The unforgiveness that you have. The Bible gives us a solution for the fruit. Go to the next slide. See what God expects of us. He gives us something called the fruits of the Spirit. You see, when you have the fruits of the Spirit in operation in your life that's following Galatians, here's what happens. The Bible says that we need to have the, the fruit in our life or the roots in our life need to be love, faithfulness, peace, and kindness, self-control and goodness and gentleness and long-suffering and joy and kindness. When you have that as the, as the root of your life, what's going to happen? You're going to begin to see some happiness. You're going to begin to see courage. You're going to see your faith come into, you're going to have certainty. That's going to be excitement. That's going to be clarity. That's going to be security, compassion, empathy. That's going to be results. Trusting God is not just a statement. It's a way of life. And you're not, it's a way, you're going to have to do some work on the soil, on the heart. You're going to have to deal with the things in your heart. You're going to have to make some, some deposits in your life to get the trust that you believe in God for to manifest in your life. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. We got to deal with the strongholds. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 and 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into, into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I've dealt with this. I'm still dealing with certain things in my life. We all are. But you got to deal with it. Listen to me. The white man is not your problem. I can say that. I can say that. I'm in a season I can say that right now. But see, some people like the white man this and the black man that and this person is that. No. Listen, your problem is the devil. And you got to deal with this stuff, man, the anger that's in your heart. I'm not saying not to deal with with, with injustice because I I believe in it. I I, I support it 100%. But the reality is I'm not going to change by way of man. I'm going to change my thinking and I'm going to see fruit in my life when I trust God. And I don't lean to my own understanding. I got to deal with the strongholds of hate and the strongholds of pain and the strongholds of my past. Amen. Mistrust. Mistrust happens 
when you have no trust or confidence, when you're suspicious of something. We've got to deal with the root of things. It's the foundation based on that that's attached to the origin of something. And the question God has for you today, how deep are your roots? What are your roots? I know we all want to know where we're from and all those things, and that's great. But the reality is when we give our life to Jesus, we become new creatures. Old things are passed away, and all things are new. And you can, have a, you can make a decision today to be one of two things. You can, be, you can have the root of a, of a tumbleweed. You know, tumbleweed is, you ever seen tumbleweed? You ever watched a movie and seen tumbleweed? I've been into the deserts and watching tumbleweed. We just roll across the road. A tumbleweed has one root, and it's very shallow. So the first wind that comes along pushes that tumbleweed down the road. And so it's always in a place of dryness, desert. And this is how some people feel in their faith and their trust in God. Or you can have the root of something else. You can have the root, not just of tumbleweed, but of a, of a, of a tree, a, a, a sturdy tree, um, a, 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 a tree that's not tumbleweed, a tree that is loaded. This is one of the strongest trees in the world. And this tree is built on its roots. This tree is not built like tumbleweed, where it's just kind of like hanging there. This tree is built on the promises of his deep roots. And God is saying to us today, he wants us to have deep roots. God is challenging us to have deep roots. You cannot have deep roots when you're living in wickedness. You cannot have deep roots when you're living in unrighteousness. Proverbs 13, 12, 3 says, wickedness never brings stability, but the godly have deep roots. Decide today you're going to have deep roots. Decide today you're going to have fruit that's going to go deep like Matthew 13, 21 says. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't um, last long. Um, they fall away as soon as they have problems. That's that tumbleweed trust. God is calling us to a place of fruitfulness. God is calling us to a place of roots in him. That's how you deal with the mess in your life. I want you to stand and I want to close. My time is up. Trusting isn't easy. It's not an easy thing to do, especially when you've been betrayed. Especially when people have lied on you. You've tried certain things and You've been abused. You've been violated. I get it. You've been mistreated. But I'm challenging you today to trust God. Believe in trusting him goes hand in hand. And God's saying, trust me. I want to build in you a strong root like the redwood. But I want to share one more tree with you as we close. It's the Chinese bamboo tree. It's one of the strongest things on the earth. But as you're trusting God today, I want to remind you of this tree. It doesn't look like much here. But what most people don't know about the bamboo tree, it's one of the most used materials in the world. Stronger second to steel. Most of the world homes and houses and structures are held together by bamboo. But here's the deal. Bamboo, the first four years it's planted. The first four years of bamboo, it doesn't even come to the surface. It's all underground for four years. So it's the fifth year that it springs up out of the ground and it becomes, here's the most people don't understand about the bamboo. It's the fastest growing tree in the world. Nothing grows faster than it. But it took it four years. You see, that may seem like four years. I got to wait four years before I can become what I need to? That's what some people feel like in their life right now. But God is saying, like a bamboo, I'm doing a work in you. Trust me now. You may not see the evidence now. 
You may not see any fruit now. You may not see the tree now, but trust me through your mess. I'm, gonna, I'm doing a work in you underground. I'm doing a work in you behind the scenes. I'm doing something inside of you that cannot be seen by man. Keep trusting me. Keep believing me. Keep worshiping me. Keep studying the word. Keep calling those things that be not as though they were. And when you do, you're going to see the fruit of the bamboo. God wants to do some things in your life today. He wants to deal with the mess in your life today. But it's going to start with you choosing. God, I'm ready. God, I'm ready. You've been, you said, Pastor Lee, it's been four years I've been trusting God. You're bamboo. It's been four years I've been going through this. It's been forever I've been seeing this. You're, you're bamboo. God's doing something in you. Trust Him. Amen? I want you to close your eyes, raise your hands right now. You're sitting here right now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you. There are people here who have some mess in their life. There are people worshiping online. They have some mess in their life. But Lord, I thank you that through the mess, you, Lord God, are blessing them in Jesus' name. They're dealing with the root right now. They're acknowledging these things, Lord God. And as they trust you, Father, you're doing miracles. You're springing up in them like a bamboo. The miracles, the breakthroughs, you're springing up in them, Lord God, supernatural things that, Lord God, man said could never stop. They could not stop doing drugs. They could not stop this disease. They could not stop thinking this way. They could not stop being this person. But in the name of Jesus, Lord, as they trust you with the mess, you're doing a work on the inside. You're cleaning their hearts. Right now, Lord God, as they stand and listen to this message, you have angels moving on their behalf. You're arranging situations right now on their behalf. And in Jesus' name, they're free from their paths, free from generational curses, free from unforgiveness, free from insecurity, free from anger, free from the taste of alcohol, free from pornography, free in the name of Jesus from a poverty mentality, free from racism, free from all of the bitterness, free in Jesus' name, free to trust you, Lord, and lean on you all the way, free, Lord God. Their character is lining up with the word. Their words are lining up with your word. Their thinking is lining up with your word. And Lord God, they'll be strong like a redwood. as they connect with others. In Jesus' name. At the end, if you need prayer, we'll have some people here to pray with you. You have some things in your life you have never, ever stepped out and said, God, I'm calling on you to help me. This is your day. And for those of you that are believing God for some things and trusting him, go out to that trust wall, write it on that wall. We're praying with you, agreeing with you all week. We've been praying. I've gone by several times and just laid my hands over top of your trust and praying in agreement with you. Our staff is doing it. We're praying with you. Amen. God bless you. This week as you go forth, I pray that you go and that you're blessed and that everything your hand touches shall prosper. May the Lord be with you. May the Lord keep you. May he make his countenance shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may this week you experience the bless, not the mess. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Message from Pastor Lee about how to trust God in the middle of our mess. That we are not our mess, that we, that we can trust God and we can help and He can get us through. So I want you to meditate on this word this week. Think about it. Put it down deep into your spirit. Read these scriptures. That's, that's how it should happen. That's how we get deeper with God. We meditate on the word and we let it soak into us over time. Don't just be a Sunday Christian. Just don't, don't just be a person that just watches the message and walks away. Take it, put it down in you. Now, before you go, I just have one thing I want to let you know of. We want to engage with you. We want to know you. If you're online and you're watching, and you maybe have never interacted with us before, you just know us from a distance. Well, we want to engage with you. We want to get to know you. So we have this thing called the Next Form or our Connect Card. You can go to abundantlife.church backslash get involved or you can scan this nice little QR code right here. We have a whole team of people 
that are waiting to talk with you. We want to talk with you. We want to pray with you. Let me bring one out. Come over here, Bryce. This is Bryce Walborn. He's a, he's a good buddy of mine. And this guy, he follows up with people, talks with people. T tell, tell them about what you do at the next room. Well, we just saw, uh, we welcome them in. We talk to them about any questions they might have, events that are going on at Abundant Life, and ways that you can get connected and serve, ways that you can uh, just connect with other people and other believers and build that community uh, that we're all looking for. Yes, yeah, so listen, if you fill out that card, you scan this QR code, you go to that website, we want to connect with you. We want to follow up with you. We want to see what's the best way that you can get involved here at Abundant Life. Everybody has a next step in their discipleship journey. It's different for everybody, and people like this and a bunch of other people on that team help you find that next step. We want to pray with you. We want to love on you. We hope you guys are able to fill all that out. Hey, have a great week this week. May God bless you abundantly above all you can ever ask or think. We love you, and we'll see you next time.